Um, and so today we're really excited to um, welcome uh, Dr. Max Moore. Um, Max is a transhumanist philosopher, uh, futurist, and uh, he's the ambassador and president emeritus of Alcor Life Extension Foundation. Um, and interestingly, he was the first to define um, futurist transhumanism and morphological freedom um, in, the, in the early 1990s, um, continuing to be a well-known advocate for using science and technology for the enhancement of the human condition beyond ordinary human limitations. His philosophies overlap really, uh, really well um, with our um, organizational mission um, and conception of uh, freedom of form. Um, and so we're really excited to uh, hear his perspectives. So I think um, Max is going to give us uh, a little bit of uh, background first, uh, and then we'll jump into some interview questions uh, interspersed with uh, Q&A from the uh, comments on YouTube. So take it away. Okay, thank you, Noel, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's always uh, very interesting for me engaging to, to talk to new groups and people I haven't really come across before. And as you said, I think there's uh, some interesting connections between the ways of thinking here, so I'd like to explore those. My plan, by the way, for those of you listening, uh, I'm not sure how you actually do things, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of background for a few minutes, and then we're going to make the rest of the session pretty much Q&A. <laughs> So if you're wondering who is this guy anyway and why is he talking to us, uh, my background in, in very brief is uh, I was when I was born. Let's go to 1986 or so uh, when I was a 22 year old in England. I started the first cryonics organization in England. So I was pretty hardcore into life extension, medical life extension from actually my teenage years, which may be a bit of a, a, bit of a weirdo to most people around me. Uh, people came into my dorm room when I was at Oxford in 1984 uh, to 7 and saw a big box of various drugs for stable and a heart lung machine and, and uh, they thought what the heck is all this stuff so uh, that was kind of unusual but I've always been interested in the idea of overcoming limits on the human condition and to me life extension was a core part of that because if you die at uh, whatever today's standard age is you don't really get enough chance to explore who you could be uh, so that's kind of how it got started then I moved to the States in 1987 to work on my, my PhD at USC and I started a magazine in 88 called Extra B which was uh, kind of a metaphor for the opposite of entropy, whereas entropy is the tendency of a closed system to move towards disorder and decay. Extropy was not meant as a technical term, but more of a metaphor for uh, openness, expansion, improvement, uh, increasing intelligence, increasing diversity, and so on. Uh, so it kind of it was a term that encapsulated my interest in things like you know, moving out into space, getting beyond the limits of Earth's gravity well, extending the lifespan, and orbiting human intelligence, being able to refine our emotions, and many other things like that. Uh, so it's kind of a single word that encapsulated that quite well. Uh, I worked on my, my doctoral dissertation, uh, finally getting it finished off in 1995, and the theme of that has got, got the typical kind of doctoral title of the diachronic self, identity, continuity, and transformation. So this was in philosophy, and, and my focus really was an age-old question, what makes you who you are? What makes you the person you are over time? Given that, obviously, if you compare yourself now to when you were five years old or two months old or how you'll be when you're 90, they might seem very different. And some people said, well, in what sense are you the same person? So I, I kind of looked at that in great detail. It's a topic that gets discussed an awful lot among transhumanists, not surprisingly. Um, and I basically, I, I, I based my work largely on that of Derek Parfit, who wrote a really brilliant book called Reasons and Persons. And I essentially adopted his view which is kind of a continuation of, uh, of John Locke and other people's views that identity is not, your identity is not really defined by your body uh, or, or by the particular matter your body is made of, because obviously that changes over time uh, from periods of you know, a few, few hours to a few years, you, you know, your matter changes over. Uh, it's not really the physical structure of your body, although that can certainly affect the way you express your personality. Um, so I kind of dug into that and I dug into questions of uh, what kind of changes can you make to the self and under what conditions before losing your sense of self. I mean, if you think about a case where you know you, you have a car accident and you smash your head against something and you come out totally changed in personality, there's a real question that maybe you're not the same person that you were before in some important sense. Um, uh, then I also had a big chapter, one of my four chapters on the concept of death. When does the self end? Uh, arguing that it's not really when we when we argue it is today. Potentially, uh, you know, we have these different kinds of death, like clinical death and legal death and medical death, and then there's really the final kind of death, information theoretic death point beyond which it's not really possible for any technology to bring you back. Uh, so that's kind of a, 
the whole area that I studied. So really the idea of what makes you who you are and how can you change yourself is fascinating to me. Uh, while, while developing that thinking, I kind of, um, I was always really a future, always really a transhumanist without knowing you know, what to call it until I came up with that term. And I have to know that historically a couple of people have actually used that term before me, but I'd never heard of them before that. You can go back and find, you know, Dante used it in some sense and uh, Julian Huxley actually the closest meaning, although not quite the same. I hadn't read any of those before, um, but I had, I certainly had a transhuman from FM 2030, another futurist, but he hadn't really used the term transhumanism, perhaps it appealed to me as a philosopher to have an ism there. Um, and in developing transhumanism, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I was kind of influenced, there were different flavors of transhumanism, and personally I was kind of influenced by, by Nietzsche to some extent. Now, you know, Nietzsche has a lot of different things, and sometimes they contradict each other, or at least appear to. My particular interest in him was really his idea that um, we are not the last word in evolution, human beings are not the last word, so basically we're a bridge between the ape and the superman. Um, and by that, he didn't mean you know, what the Germans then perverted to mean. Uh, he really meant something beyond the limits of human beings. And he talked about the importance of choosing a self, not of being yourself, but of choosing a self, because you get to uh, develop who, who you are over time. But in my view, uh, you know, the existentialists talk about choosing who you are every moment. The problem with their view is that they don't have the technological means to do that right now. You can't just will yourself to be totally different. You can try, you can maybe gradually make some progress, but you know, you have a basic personality that's really hard to change. And uh, you know, if you're born kind of wimpy and scrawny, you're not going to win Mr. Olympia. It doesn't matter how many steroids you take right now. So until you make some basic changes in your biology and neurology, there are limits out there. Um, but those limits will shift over time, and that was the idea. So that's kind of um, my trajectory, really, of, of being interested in creating a self, extending the self, and exploring all the possibilities of the self. Uh, I don't want to overlap any of the questions. Noel has a great set of questions which cover pretty much everything I was going to say. So just a little bit about transhumanism. Um, for those of you who are not that familiar with the idea, my sort of 101 version of transhumanism is you can think of transhumanism as transhumanism or as transhumanism. Now, what I mean by that is the trans. Humanism part basically means it's an extension of the humanist uh, tradition in the sense that humanists kind of rejected the authority of religion and uh, any you know, popes and authorities like that and said we have to rely on reason, human reason and creativity driven by goodwill and that progress was possible, we are not doomed to live in a miserable world and we should in fact try to improve things and also an emphasis on humans, not any particular group that we should all, you know, all share in that future. So transhumanism went beyond that because the humanist kind of got stuck on human I actually wrote a piece for Free Inquiry magazine, which at least back then in the early 90s was the, the leading uh, humanist magazine on how transhumanism differed. And it's interesting, half the audience were really hostile and the other half were really interested. So I kind of split there, but I still stuck on, on what is human? Well, the question really is why why should we be limited by what, whatever human is, even if it's biological, if we can start to change that. And we can talk about some of those possible changes. So that's kind of the basic idea of transhumanism. It involves this idea of morphological freedom, which we'll discuss, which I think will be of interest to you. Um, it includes the idea of basically questioning all, all limits on the human condition. Just because they've been there for a long time doesn't mean they have to be. Just like, you know, pretty much every culture has slavery for a long time. It was just what you did. Uh, we didn't all consider that acceptable. It's a you know, pretty obvious example. Uh, so I think that's probably all I need to say to begin with. I think we'll cover pretty much everything else as we go along. Thanks to Noah's really good set of questions. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, so I think uh, one of the first questions um, that is going to be um, on our minds uh, is while there's uh, a great deal of hope uh, that comes from the promise of transhumanism um, and what that future could look like, uh, there's a set of people uh, who are, uh, in a way, uh, naysayers in the sense that um, they criticize um, this kind of uh, modification as being unnatural um, or immoral or possibly even technologically impossible. Um, so how do you uh, react um, to those uh, naysayers who criticize um, transhumanism as uh, being unnatural or in some kind of negative light? Oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different objections, really. The, the unnatural one, I just find kind of a little bit silly. Uh, you know, what is natural for human beings? Uh, 
uh, if you mean by natural something that uh, that is part of nature without human beings, I guess we're going to have to go back to the caves, not have any fire, just live in animal skins, and that's pretty much it. That's natural. But that's kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, beavers build dams, so you can't say that dams are unnatural. That's part of what being a beaver is. And to me, a core part of, of being a human, and this comes from humanism, is the idea that we are questioning beings, we're creating beings, uh, we build and create and develop things, and we question things. Uh, so what's natural to humans is precisely to change the world. That's what we've done a lot and we continue to do. And now we're just beginning to develop the technological means to change our internal nature through genetic alterations, neurological alterations, and so on. So how can it be unnatural for us to do what's really what makes us human in the first place? So that one I find kind of lazy thinking in a sense. It's kind of, it's the naturalistic fallacy really that says what is natural is good. Well, it really isn't. If if natural is good, why on earth are you taking vaccines to to murder that poor coronavirus vaccine? It's perfectly, uh, coronavirus uh, is perfectly natural, so leave it alone. Obviously, not all of nature is good. It's, It's actually quite neutral. It's up to us to define what parts of nature we want to enhance. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I want to um, uh, I want to pivot uh, a little bit to uh, some of your uh, background in uh, one aspect of transhumanism, which is uh, life extension, which is um, to uh, transcend um, our mortality in a sense. Um, and so you've, uh, as you've mentioned, um, worked uh, much of your career uh, with. Um, Alcor Life Extension Foundation, having uh, led them for uh, many years and now being the uh, President Emeritus, I believe, um, there. Uh, So uh, the question uh, that I uh, think we all have is, uh, how did you approach uh, leadership of Alcor? How did it uh, come to uh, be as an organization? And have you uh, encountered interesting uh, technological roadblocks um, that you were able to overcome along the way? Oh boy, that's quite a lot. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's a so, uh, question. <laughs> so when did it come to be? Well, it actually came to be in 1972. Um, we're actually in our 50th year right now, and we're planning to have a, a big uh, Extro 50, I mean, sorry, Alcor 50 conference next year in June. Uh, February will actually be 50. So we've been around for a long time. Um, it was started by Fred Linda Chamberlain. Fred was literally a rocket scientist, and he didn't like the idea of dying. And uh, he, he kind of read about this idea. It was just getting started in, back in the late 60s. And he and Linda started Alcohol, and it's still, you know, it's really the, the leading organization still today. I took the job because, um, you know, as I said, I've been interested in life extension for a long time. But by the time the job came up, I was, you know, well into my 40s, and I wasn't seeing much progress going on in life extension. Um, I'd been following it, you know, since I was a teenager, and not a whole lot seemed to be really happening. There were some interesting new theories, interesting possible approaches, but basically we hadn't found a way of breaking the human maximum lifespan yet. Um, and I'm hoping that's going to change. It's a lot more interest in it these days. There's a lot more funding. The VCs are sniffing around looking for opportunities. Um, you know, Google has a, a, a big research thing which we don't know anything about. We don't know if it's a complete failure or if it's doing interesting stuff. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos has now got a new company, Outsource, with others. So we don't know what's going to happen, but I'm pretty pretty cautious these days. Now I'm 57. Um, I don't know how much longer I have, hopefully at least 30 years, but I figure I may not make it to the time when we can actually control the aging process. So what's my what's my option? Well, I really don't like it, like the idea of being shoved in the ground and munched on by worms and bacteria. That just sucks. Uh, or being shoved into an oven and incinerated, that sucks too. So my third option is, okay, when I'm clinically dead, which doesn't mean I'm actually really dead, it just means my heart stopped and my uh, breathing has stopped, I want to be cryopreserved and have the cells protected against ice formation in the possibility that the future may have more advanced technology that can reverse whatever killed me in today's sense and uh, repair and rejuvenate me. So that seems like the better option. So when when it turned out that the, the job was available, that they needed someone to take over as CEO, um, I kind of, at first I thought, oh my goodness, that's a lot of responsibility. But I finally took the job and moved from Austin, where I was living at the time here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and took that on. And my goal really was to um, treat, well, really the alcohol tradition, to treat cryonics as an evidence-based practice. We're not just here to hope it works and to pretend it works and to, you know, not really know if it works or not. We want to know how well it's working or if it's not working, then you look for an alternative and uh, to make it work better. So uh, one of the first things to talk about technological obstacles, well, there's a number of those. One, of course, that people always bring up but don't really uh, understand how it works is the problem of ice formation when you cryopreserve people. 
people often hear, uh, even people who should know better, like Michio Kaku, the popular physicist, uh, he did a YouTube video to which I did a rebuttal, uh, you might want to check that online, where he repeated the, the same mistake that when you uh, go below the freezing point, ice forms inside the cells and expands and kind of blows them up, and that's just not what happens, even if you don't protect them, that's not what happens. If it did, uh, you wouldn't better cryopreserve embryos and sperm and eggs and skin and heart valves and all the other things we do cryopreserve, that wouldn't be possible. Um, what actually happens is cells dehydrate and ice forms between the cells, you don't protect them, and that causes some damage, but nothing like building them up. But at Alcor, you know, for a long time we've been using various solutions, originally based on glycerol solutions, that will protect against ice formation. And around the year 2000 or so, 2001, we started applying a technique called vitrification, uh, which, so instead of, we don't actually literally freeze these days, we vitrify, and that comes from the Latin word for glass. So what that means is the solution that replaces the blood and other fluids becomes more and more viscous and holds the cells in place without any ice crystal formation. And uh, we know that we can cryopreserve you know, embryos and other tissues by that method and bring them back. Um, we're on the verge of being able to do whole human organs, not quite there yet, there's been some success with rabbit kidneys, um, but maybe in the next few years we'll be able to cryopreserve human organs, keep them in a hospital, take them out as needed, rather than losing tens of thousands of lives a year because you can't find a tissue match. So you know, the most important part to preserve is the brain, so I think we're pretty close to doing that, and we're continuing to look at ways of improving this process and making it more reversible. And one of the things I, I started on, like a couple of years after I started was, uh, I want to know how well are we doing this? right now because you can't really see inside the skull so we discovered that actually we could do CT scans of our neuro patients in liquid nitrogen and the aluminum cans of it are actually transparent to CT rays so now we have all these studies of cryopreserved brains and we can show which ones are really good and which ones not so good and start learning you know, how to do better so there's really a lot of different technological areas and we're doing a lot of research right now but uh, that, that's just kind of some of the high points that's very exciting to hear so we have a few um, interesting Q&A questions uh, that have come through uh, in the comments uh, spinning off of this. Um, so one of the first ones is uh, currently, uh, despite uh, cryonics having um, a good technological basis um, and being a really interesting um, method which is becoming uh, more and more well established, uh, it's still a relatively uh, niche area uh, and there's a relatively small number of uh, people who probably are even aware of it, um, or more than that, would consider it as uh, something that they would uh, want to pursue. So the question um, that was posed is, uh, how do we uh, normalize cryonics um, in a way that makes it more uh, accessible, I think, uh, to the public at large? Yeah, that's a good question. It's one I wrestle with all the time. It's uh, incredibly frustrating to me that there are so few of us after several decades. Um, and, you know, that's a big question. Why are there so few and what can we do about it? Uh, I actually gave a talk at the uh, uh, the Bill Conference. I don't know if you know the Bill Conferences. They kind of used to be on the side of the TED Conferences, TED and Bill. Uh, and I gave a talk called Join the 0.0004%. <laughs> so I tried to make a virtue of the fact that it was so uncommon. Uh, but it is kind of crazy to me that we don't uh, have far more members at this point. And I, I do think that will change. I, I do imagine at some point in the future this will just this will be normal. It'll be something that hospitals have, you know, chronic units to begin the process. Um, and this will be uh, obvious. People will scratch their head as to why we didn't do this earlier. Just as we do now with, uh, you know, even things like uh, antisepsis, which took decades to take off. It's ridiculous now that how many people died because people were washing their hands and using antisepsis. That's very different. That's kind of an interesting example because you can compare that to painkillers, which caught on very quickly. And you think, well, why did antisepsis take decades, whereas painkillers was really quick. Well, I think it's clear that there's a very clear benefit on both sides to painkillers. You know, if you're having a leg chop chopped off, you want you want something to dull the pain. If you're the surgeon trying to hold them down while you cut the leg off, you also want the same thing. So there's a very clear incentive to adopt that. Whereas antisepsis is kind of invisible, um, you can't see it. And cryonics is uh, not quite the same, but it has some major obstacles in the sense that, first of all, it really upsets people's fundamental beliefs about life and death, right? It, it questions what is death exactly? At what point do you really die? At what point are you recoverable? And that, things that challenge people at a fundamental level make them very uncomfortable. And then we, it's even worse than that because uh, in giving our answer to that as a possibility, we don't offer any certainty. We don't say, look, sign up for us and we guarantee you'll come back and everything will be great. We don't do that because that will just be dishonest. We can't make those guarantees. We can't absolutely guarantee the technology will actually happen, although we think it's plausible. We can't guarantee you know, the government won't ban us or someone will blow us up. There's all kinds of things that could happen. And people don't want to hear that. They want to hear, 
look, okay, I, I, I accept this belief system, I sign up for this, I'm going to go to heaven or whatever. That's what they want. They want certainty. Or if they don't think that's possible, they want to be certain they're dead and that's it. I don't have to worry about it anymore. They have to settle the mind one way or another. And that's one big problem with, with human nature is we like certainty. And we don't offer certainty. We offer a lot of uncertainty. Plus, you know, you think about, okay, I come back in the future. How many people do I know? My skills be outdated. What will I do for a living? Um, you know, that scares the hell out of most people. So our members tend to be a little unusual and they're more adventurous, experimental. They say, uh, actually, I'd like, I'd like to quote uh, Larry King here, who expressed interest in cryonics, but unfortunately didn't follow through. And on one of his shows, someone asked him, well, Larry, you won't have any friends. He went, eh, I'll make new friends. <laughs> Which I think is a perfectly decent answer if you can't convince your friends to come with you. So th that's some of the reasons I think that um, people don't do this. Plus, I've seen, you know, over the years, so many people say, I want to do this, but just never get around to it because they have to make, you know, contracts, and provide funding and all this stuff. It's not that simple. It's, it's kind of like getting a mortgage, basically. It's, it's kind of the, uh, probably at least as difficult as that. Although we're trying to simplify things and automate sign up. But those are some of the reasons. Uh, I do think that uh, once people understand that death isn't quite what they think is. I was just reading something this morning where someone wrote a blog on this this morning and it was just wrong again. He said, he was calling these medical students idiots because they, they talk about clinical death. He said, well, you know, clinical death, he just misunderstood what it meant. Clinical death is not death. Clinical death means your breathing has stopped, your heart has stopped. That doesn't mean all your cells have suddenly instantly died. Um, you know, we have different different standards over time. People used to stop breathing or breathing was not detectable, but they actually were not dead. And that's where we get uh, uh, the bells that people used to put on graveyards because people were actually buried alive, not, not uncommonly, and they actually started putting bells there. You could call on a, a cord to say, I'm not dead yet, I'm not dead yet. That's in Monty Python. Um, so, you know, when are you really dead? It's not when your heart stops beating because uh, that's clinical death, but that's reversible, and we do it all the time now. And not just from five minutes. That idea that your brain's dead after three to five minutes without oxygen is really not true. That's on, under certain conditions. There are people being brought back after three quarters of an hour for an hour or more of clinical death, no brain activity, no blood flow. Uh, and those are people who have been, you know, fall into very cold water, slow down the metabolism, and they've been carefully rewarmed. Uh, so we know it's not a sharp line like that. And our view is, so long as the brain structure is intact that preserves your memory and personalities, there is the possibility that one day we can repair that damage and revive you. Now, that's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. It's going to take some decades at least, and nobody knows exactly how long, but it seems like a pretty, pretty plausible bet. But death is not what people think. Um, and that will lead to some other questions maybe later as to different uh, platforms for the human being rather than biological body. So it sounds like um, also that uh, some of the uh, doubt that uh, people have uh, coming from the uncertainty uh, that comes from uh, cryonics is if you uh, if you aren't certain um, of how you might be thought um, or brought back, um, what is the uh, assurance at least that there's a technological basis uh, that it's going to work? I think a lot of people have some uh, some doubts. Um, that it's even possible to begin with. Uh, so I guess um, the question is, uh, could you speak uh, briefly on some of the initial indications, whether those be animal studies um, or uh, your own internal uh, Alcor studies uh, that lead you to believe uh, that there's at least a decent likelihood um, that this will work? Right. I think there's two main aspects to this. First of all, you need to be able to demonstrate that under the conditions that we have today, the procedures we have today, that we are actually sufficiently preserving neural structure uh, in a way that is you know, then potentially viable in the future. And the second big thing is, which we can't really do definitively today because it's not it's not today, you have to be able to show that there's some plausible belief that uh, it will be possible to repair people and revive them in the future. So these are two different things. And you know, I mentioned the CT scans. That's part of the first aspect of this, that we can actually show uh, that in many cases we are preserving the brain pretty well. We've either eliminated or minimized ice formation. Uh, we've done some studies actually that hopefully a paper will be out sometime early next year. Um, we did it on, a, on one patient, a special case, where we actually took brain samples and did uh, not just electron microscopy, but um, differential scanning camera M3 and a whole bunch of other scanning tests. And uh, from what I understand, the results are really good. Uh, this is you know, a specially done case. The brain structure is fantastic. You can see everything is preserved. The neurons are intact, the connections are intact. Everything we know about the biology of memory, which is not complete, uh, suggests that we have actually preserved that pretty well. Now, that's not always the case. It depends on the circumstances and possible delays. Uh, but that means that, you know, we can at least show now that 
it's pretty plausible that what matters has been preserved. But okay, you say, well, okay, fine, but how do we know you can ever bring that back in the future? That requires some kind of magical technology. Well, my answer is it doesn't really, because if you think about what nature already does, it's pretty amazing. And it's a matter of us learning to control it. Right now, if you think about where did you come from, when I mean, if you didn't know this, and I told you this, it would seem insane, but we all know it's true. You came from a single fertilized cell. And they became trillions of cells, you became this thing. How is that possible? That seems magical, right? Uh, well, not really, but it's an extremely complex process, obviously. Uh, certain animals can regenerate limbs. We can't do that. We're pretty crappy at it. You know, when you're an embryo, you can actually regenerate a lot better and you lose that ability as your genes start to differentiate more. You can cut off the tip of a finger and you can probably regenerate just the tip. Uh, the liver can regenerate a little bit. That's about it. So we're really crappy at that, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn to regenerate things. In fact, we've already started to grow organs in the lab with the stage of proto-organs right now. Uh, and it's very plausible to think it won't be too long before we can re regenerate limbs and other tissues uh, quite regularly. So that would certainly help what we're doing. And if we can show that you can actually cryopreserve human organs reversibly, I think that makes it extremely plausible because the brain, the most important part of the body, is an organ. Um, and yeah, I, I'm of the view, as, as uh, some other future thinkers say, that anything which doesn't contradict the laws of physics should one day be achievable. At least if you say it's impossible, the, the onus is on you to show why it's impossible. Because if physics doesn't rule it out, why should we do it? Okay, so if physics says we can't do time travel, then okay, we can't do time travel unless we find some interesting workaround that doesn't violate the laws of physics. But tissue repair doesn't violate laws of physics, it happens all the time. We're talking about guiding it. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because just this morning I was checking in with Robert Fritas, who's written two books on nanomedicine, basically use of nanoscopic devices uh, to repair tissue. He has a new book coming out that I'll who actually funded the work on it, ended up being not a paper, but an 800 page book with like 3,000 references uh, exactly on this issue of how do you repair cryopreserved patients? And he's kind of the world's expert on that. So, you know, again, we can't prove this will work, but my, my, my view is really it seems plausible for mechanisms we can see, we can point to extensions of current research, and anyone who says it's impossible really needs to say why. Uh, you know, I remember being on a, on, a, uh, on a TV show quite a few years ago, and this guy who's a professor of surgery was kind of make, mocking me, trying to make fun of it. He says, what you're talking about is like trying to jump from here to the moon. And I, I try to put it, actually, no, it's not at all like that, because that violates laws of physiology and physics and all kinds of other things. Uh, that's just a stupid analogy. So there's a lot of very weak arguments like that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we have a number of uh, questions um, that stem from uh, this discussion. Um, I won't be able to cover them all because I'm just uh, being conscious of time and uh, there's some uh, other uh, really cool things that uh, we want to talk about uh, today. But um, one of them uh, that I will ask um, is uh, one person uh, wants to know um, what life extension plan uh, do you favor? Uh, and I guess uh, that's in the sense of uh, both in uh, current life, uh, um, prior to uh, cryopreservation, uh, what do you think um, is some of the most uh, promising uh, avenues for uh, life extension um, currently in the field? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I keep my mind pretty much open because things change all the time and I don't really know what the best approach will be. I don't think things like telomerase therapy look very promising these days, or that might be part of the answer. Um, I'm quite sympathetic to the uh, Aubrey de Grey's approach of basically looking at seven different processes by which bodies age and break down. It's largely a process of, uh, you know, of entropy in various different ways. And his approach is not to worry so much about having a grand theory of aging, but rather to tackle those processes where things are falling apart and figure out how to stop them and reverse them. So I think that's one promising approach. But I don't necessarily want to rule out other approaches. There are people who believed in programmed aging, um, that evolution has somehow selected us to uh, just suddenly age at a certain point and die off to make room for the you know, next generation. There are a number of different theories um, so I don't know which one will ultimately turn out to be true. I, I do think that, uh, you know, one thing I like to say about aging is, going back to the issue of what's natural and what's moral, there's nothing there's nothing sacred about aging or the, the age we die at. Uh, as I like to point out, unless you're a fundamentalist, uh, it's pretty clear that we evolved into our current form and that aging is a, process, is, is a result of evolution because evolution's goal, you know, Richard Dawkins' term, it's about selfish replicators, selfish genes. They're only interested, interested in quotes, of course, in passing on to the next generation. And once you've passed reproductive age, 
age, they don't really give a crap about you if you off an age and die because you've already passed to the next generation. So we're not selecting for very long life there. And you can look at that across different ecological niches and see how that explains some of the variation in lifespan. Uh, so there's nothing special about that. If the question is more about what can you do right now rather than sort of theoretical approaches, uh, I honestly don't think there's a whole lot of really interesting stuff you can do. I think there are a few things. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the difficult answer is still, if you want to minimize your chances of dying early at least, it's still all about exercise and diet. Sorry, but you know it's still hard work. Uh, so you've still got to do that. But I think there are some very interesting things. I was actually in a clinical trial, which looks like we'll get going again soon, back in 2016, I think, um, run by Greg Fay, who's uh, also a cryobiologist, but also very interested in gerontology. And he looked at research on the past into thymus regeneration. You know, thymus up here is basically responsible for your T cells and a lot of your immune systems, something that people should be very interested in right now. And once you reach uh, you know, adulthood, it, it gradually atrophies over time until I tell you, about 60 is basically a lump of useless fat and you're just living on old T cells and not really regenerating. And Greg found that there was research showing that in some animals, they either uh, they are able to regenerate the thymus with growth hormone or they could transplant fresh ones and they found the immune system was vastly boosted, it was rejuvenated. And then he saw there was more research doing that with AIDS patients. So he thought, well, what about doing it with healthy, normal males uh, to start with? And so uh, I was part of the first trial of that. So 10 or 12 of us, I was actually patient number one, and we spent a year uh, getting injected with human growth hormone along with some other factors to mitigate the rise in insulin. And uh, after we actually finished the samples, well, first of all, it, it's it seemed to work pretty well. We actually had to have scans done at Stanford Medical School to look at our, our thymus glands and they, the, the cortex, the part that does the real work, did seem to be rejuvenated, so hopefully that did work. Um, but also, uh, along came Steve Horvath, who's one of the leading, well, maybe the leading person in aging clocks. Um, he's, he's constantly innovating in aging clocks and looking at what biological markers uh, relate really to fundamental aging. And which is very important because if you're doing life extension research, you can't really wait 50 years to see what worked. You need something that works a little more quickly. And um, Greg gave him some of these samples and he looked at them and he said that uh, we actually, we, uh, our basic biological age reversed by maybe a year or a year and a half over that year. So we ended up actually biologically younger. And what was interesting was that pretty much all took place in the last three months. So I think one goal of the next round, which I want to be involved with, sure, is to let's extend that, maybe do this for 18 months or two years and see if that sticks and if it actually it goes even further. So that's kind of an exciting one because the immune system obviously is very important to not dying young. That won't get you to live past the human maximum, which you know, right now the world record holder is 122. Uh, so that's the one to beat and she's actually well ahead of number two. Um, yeah, there are things like NAD therapy that some people are excited about. I'm not, I'm not that enthused uh, about it. Uh, I, I think we're still waiting for the real breakthrough. So right now it's about not dying early and keeping your brain and body healthy. Uh, I don't think we have a magical answer. It did look promising for a while. Um, and I was, a, yeah, I was a good friend of Roy Walford at UCLA who pioneered a lot of the uh, caloric restriction experiments. And he was a big fan of that and thought that could actually extend our lives to maybe 150. But it turns out that's actually very relative to the life span of the animal, or actually maybe more to the uh, you know the summer winter feeding cycle, and that shouldered organisms. You can extend the lives massively by, by calorie restriction, like 100% or more. But as you move up the chain, you find that you know, they did this at NIH with, uh, with, with apes. They got a rather small extension, pretty good increase in health, um, but it didn't. It doesn't do very much. It might do two or three more years and more health. Um, but if you take it too drastically, the problem is you get fragile. And what people don't often consider is these were laboratory animals in cages, you're well maintained. We're in the real world, uh, even today, <laughs> we have to go out to the real world. You may have an accident, you may get COVID, go to hospital, if you're very scrawny, you don't have much extra resources to live on. So going to an extreme with caloric restriction probably isn't worth it given the limited benefits. So my unfortunately somewhat uh, down of view is there's not a whole lot you can do other than working hard, exercise and diet, and keep an eye out for these new developments. But I think immune rejuvenation looks quite promising at this point. That's very exciting. So there's one more uh, question uh, that I think we'll uh, cover before um, moving on to some uh, more questions. Um, I apologize to other people who have uh, uh, ask questions that uh, we won't have time to uh, cover in this uh, session. So, uh, this question is uh, about um, the brain being uh, the most important uh, thing to uh, preserve and continue. Uh, so, the question is um, how do you feel about extending the uh, runtime or expiration date of the brain or consciousness rather than the whole body? 
uh, which I guess ties into um, the neuro option um, in Alcor. Yeah. Uh, well, I think they kind of go together. Uh, let me just explain that um, among Alcor members, about half our members are signed to preserve the whole body and half just the brain, which in practice means leaving it in the skull for practical reasons. I'm one of the people who's always chosen just the, the neuro option, as we call it, because my view is that any kind of technology that can repair the aging process, which obviously we need to do, we don't want to bring you back as an old person just to conk out again. Uh, if you have that kind of technology that can fix aging, cancer, heart disease, all the other issues that could be deadly, um, and rejuvenate the cells uh, and repair everything, that kind of technology will better regenerate a body pretty easily by comparison. I mean, fixing the brain with you know 86 billion neurons is going to be a big job and require something like nanotechnology. Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe if we can preserve you well enough, it might not require that level of technology. But we're already starting to see, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the ability to regenerate body parts and organs. So I think we're going to do that a lot sooner than we can repair a brain. So that's why I'm not concerned about you know being a, a you know, future armor brain on a floating pad or something. I don't think that's going to be the way. Uh, I mean, when you come back, you know, we can we can speculate as to the options. When you're revived, they might kind of wake you up part way and say, hey, look, we've got some options you might not have considered. We can either bring you back as you expected at your best, your physical peak of best, uh, or we've got these cool new cyborg bodies that you might want to try out. You know, who knows what the options are? But our kind of base scenario is that, well, we we'll regenerate the body, uh, and basically, you know, all your cells contain the full complement of DNA, so you just need to support the brain and regenerate a body downwards. Uh, I don't think it'll be true cloning. I mean, in principle, you could clone the body, a decerebrated clone, transplant the brain, but I think it's more likely to be actually regeneration of the body. So, to me, it doesn't really matter if your neuro or body you're going to end up the same, I believe. Makes sense. Uh, so, I think. But again, just to, to follow up, you know, <laughs> I say the brain's the most important because you can't have a brain transplant. If you get someone else's brain, it's not you, it's them. Everything else is replaceable. The brain is the one thing you can't replace right now. Makes sense. That's Ty. Sounds like it answers the question. So I think uh, for uh, for now um, we'll pivot uh, away from uh, cryonics and towards uh, some other aspects um, of transhumanism. So uh, I'm going to ask about um, actually in the 90s um, you coined a term um, called morphological freedom. Um, as a central idea um, in transhumanism. So I wondered uh, if you could um, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, what the term um, means to you, um, how you define it, um, and why you think it's important um, to transhumanism. Yeah, I think there's a lot of inconsistent thinking about you know, personal freedoms regarding the body. We see a lot of people you know, arguing for one kind of freedom, um, but not another. Some people want to you know, ban drugs, but want to allow uh, you know, gay sex or whatever. I mean, there's one thing okay and one thing that's not okay. To me, it's the same principle. It's your body. Nobody else has a right to interfere with what you do with your body, other than clearly the proviso you don't use it to harm other people. So, you know, the right of me to swing my fist, sends it your face, and so on. But apart from that, really, you know, I don't believe in things like drug laws. I don't believe in uh, people ban banning cosmetic surgery or people dressing up how they want or getting sex changes. Uh, um, whatever I might think of any of those personally, I think those are things that everybody should have a right to. And that's because of the fundamental right that of self-ownership. You own your body. Nobody else does. Uh, you're the one who's responsible for it. So you should be making those choices and know that you're responsible for it. And we shouldn't be imposing... I mean, basically, when you, when you stop people exercising that freedom, people learn to be infantile. They don't, uh, they don't learn responsibility. And you know, <laughs> things get pretty bad. So I think we need a general principle that you have this right of autonomy over your body. Um, and that includes the more radical form, and morphological freedom expresses that, but includes the ability to you know, modify your body in quite drastic ways. I mean, already we have people who do uh, you know, make all kinds of alterations to the body and you know, do things with their ears and their nose and so on. Uh, and of course, tattoos have been around forever. Um, so there are even more radical versions of that where you may want to you know, have different limbs, whether they're biological, when that's possible, or, or you know, cybernetic limbs. Um, you might even want to change your appearance so radically that you don't even appear human. And people go and freak out about that. But I, I think those are things that everybody should have a right to do. And I think it's important to establish that right early on. Um, that includes the, you know, the right not to have things done to you, very importantly. This is a negative right. It's a freedom right. It's not a right to have someone, someone else pay for you to have a procedure. It's your right for you to do it yourself without interference. 
And that also means that uh, we can't have governments or other people telling you what you can do with your babies. And, you know, they can't tell you how to design your babies. That should be up to you. They can't tell you uh, what kinds of augmentations are allowed and what are not. Uh, and we're a very long way from that in, in any country. But certainly in this country, the SBA uh, have tremendous power over you know, what things we can do. And they've expanded that power over time. So it's really a fundamental idea that this is a negative right to be free of interference, to be allowed that choice, uh, and to learn to be responsible for that. So whether it's, you know, not just fit physiological changes, but also neurological changes. And of course, we do that already to some extent with antidepressants, and anti-anxiety treatments. People who are, you know, burdened with these issues, and I've struggled with depression myself, I know what that's like, um, we should be free to try and fix that. And right now, our methods are very crude. You know, we use these drugs that are not that well targeted. It'd be a lot better if we could actually find out what's going on in the brain and change its expression of the genes so we produce our own neurochemistry properly without the side effects. Um, but, you know, you can imagine that there would be some pretty drastic changes. So I want to really change the way their brain works in the future. Um, there's, a, there's a really good novel by, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, it's an Australian science fiction writer. I'm forgetting his name right now. His first book was called Quarantine. He's written some very interesting stuff after that. But one thing I liked about this was he talked about neurotechnologies in the book. And his character kind of argued that the most interesting thing about these neurotechnologies, ways of modulating your brain, um, was not the creation of exotic new mental states. It was the ability to focus. And you know, the main character is a private detective, and he could actually switch his brain so that if he had to stalk someone out, he could just totally focus on one thing for as long as it took without getting distracted. Other people could tune themselves to be extremely creative and produce new music or new writing. Basically, well to select those mental states. Because right now, sometimes you know you need to get down to work, but you think, oh God, I really wish I could have sex right now. And you start thinking about that, or oh, I wish I could eat some food right now. It'd be nice if you could decide to tune those up or down at, at various times. So I'm not just talking about kind of bodily changes, but neurological changes changes, emotional alterations, and yes, that certainly raises a lot of issues, we want to be, want to be careful about that, um, but I, I think, you know, again, we evolve these characteristics, both a lot of pretty bad characteristics, a lot of tribalism uh, is good at evolutionary, we have a very hard time getting beyond us and them, and that's something I think uh, won't, sh well, we can modify that culturally, but I think it's still there in our, in our genes, and to really do away with that, we'll make progress, we're going to have to make some fundamental changes at some point, but personal changes, not something forced on people. I want to um, uh, segue that actually uh, into a question of how this applies to um, our organization, uh, the Freedom of Form Foundation. Uh, and so uh, for us, uh, we advocate for um, what we call freedom of form, which ties in very well with uh, the concept of um, morphological freedom. Um, and uh, we define that as being uh, the right to uh, expression of the self uh, through uh, total uh, biological self-determination, um, even if the goal uh, is a form that substantially deviates uh, from traditional human anatomy, uh, including non-human anatomies. Um, so I guess uh, the question is to um, explicitly ask, uh, do you see um, your conception of morphological freedom as uh, including these kinds of uh, radically different um, morphologies uh, that deviate very substantially uh, from uh, human anatomy. Um, and also, had you been uh, previously aware of people who wanted to do this? Uh, it, it does include that, that right, certainly. Um, and again, to stress that this is a negative right, that doesn't mean that uh, you know, if you want to look radically different, just like just today, some people might want to you know, dress in radically different ways. That doesn't mean you have a right to you know, work at a job where people accept that because they have rights too. But it doesn't mean that there can't be any general um, you know, banning of that or any oppression of people who want to do that. Um, I, uh, I haven't been aware of your organization until recently, but um, obviously there's a lot of different subcultures that probably have aspects of this. There are the uh, you know, people with tattoos again that become quite popular again, <clears throat> um, you know, piercings and uh, various body modifications. Uh, there's the whole biohacking area that I'm obviously interested in too. I gave a talk in the, over in the Finland a few years ago. It was very interesting. Uh, so that, that's all kind of part of this. And then, of course, I know people who want to dress up in various ways to look like non-humans. And uh, that can also, of course, be done virtually online. You can have a virtual persona. But in the future, you might actually be able to as you physically change your body, uh, either permanently or temporarily, to express more, you know, to grow gills or a tail or, or fur or whatever. And yeah, I absolutely think that should be each person's right. The only thing I think uh, could not, you know, is, is, is dangerous and that you maybe have to have some very careful rule against. Again, your right to your freedom has to be uh, equal to other people's rights. So uh, there was a there was a novel, I can't remember the author, but it was basically a sequel to, to Blade Runner and not the same as the, the second movie that came out. And the character in there had something 
uh, done to his brain so that uh, he had no he had no fear and he would get more and more build more and more rage sort of the opposite of what you would you'd normally do anything that would make you calm would make him more angry well that's not the kind of thing we probably would allow because that's extremely dangerous that'd be like you know someone driving drunk at 150 miles an hour so I think there would be kind of limits like that but that's that's pretty obvious stuff I think so long as it's not something that's clearly directly threatening harm to people feelings are not and, and I know this is unpopular to say these days but feelings are not uh, being offended is not a form of harm in my view I think it's just a lot of bullshit here people say oh my feelings are offended because you you said some word that oh it's hurt me because you said this word bullshit get over it and grow up uh, you know I don't understand how they can say that but also say oh we have to accept say gay people or trans people well, what about the people who are offended by that it's inconsistent so you know we have to better be accepting of each other it doesn't mean you have to necessarily agree with it or think that's a good idea but you have to be able to accept it and treat people with respect so if someone wants to look like a cat or an alien or whatever yeah just that's fine and I think we have the right to do that and we have to learn to live with that um, I think it's you know it's interesting we, we can do that clearly and that's actually kind of amazing people talk about how it, we are not accepting of people but in some ways it's amazing how much progress we've made in a short period of time if you think historically um, let's just take you know being gay for instance but historically that was that was something nobody could speak about for a long time it's kind of known in sub circles but basically you, you probably get killed for most of human history and then you know starting in the 60s it's just started to get going and then within just a very few decades it's become totally accepted and you know the tv shows and everything and now we're seeing the same happening with, with transgender people an incredibly short period of time so i think that gives us some hope that actually we can learn and become more accepting that's very encouraging to hear. So I want to um, segue this uh, into another aspect uh, that spins off of um, morphological freedom, um, which is a related term um, that you coined in the same essay uh, where you coined that term, uh, which is transbiomorphosis, where you uh, propose to uh, describe a process of creating rationally engineered um, improved bodies um, by intervening um, in and or replacing existing biological processes. Um, and in that same point, uh, you predicted that uh, the technologies of transformation, that's a, that's a quote, um, will come to exist in the decades to come. Um, so I wanted to ask uh, if you could elaborate on what you had in mind um, when developing the concept of transbiomorphosis and in practical terms, uh, how do you envision uh, such a process taking place? Yeah, so I could have already maybe hinted a little bit in terms of the biological technologies we're starting to develop and which could use, be used not just for repair but for changes to the body, transformations of the body. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing this coming along quite rapidly now. It's uh, a very kind of simple form of this is in choosing babies, basically, you know, designer babies as the term has come to be. Um, we're seeing some very interesting things like PGD, uh, pre-implementation pre genetic diagnosis. I may actually know some, some people at the park who are perfectly kind of normal conservative couple, but they actually uh, chose which embryo to implant. They had you know, IVF, looked at the embryos, chose which one seemed to be have, you know, lacking any kind of problematic characteristics, and that's the baby they had. And you know, they didn't have a problem with that, which is kind of interesting. That's that's a, a form of choosing uh, you know a better a better self for the child you're having rather than having someone born with depression or mental illness or uh, you know, a hole in the heart or something like that. I can't really see why people would have any problem with that. Um, but further along, especially here in terms of children, um, which I think will become increasingly a uh, precious commodity in a sense to put it in economist terms as population growth uh, is continuing to slow down and people are having fewer and fewer children. I think we'll put more and more time into planning you know, the best child we can have and why not? Um, so I think rather than just fixing you know, preventing problems, I think why not give your child uh, you know, good physical health and a sharp brain and uh, musical capability and mathematical capability? And I personally would not want to give him just one of them to try and force it into my model of what I think a good person is. I want to give it all of them. And then, so the child is gifted in every area, uh, and then they can make a choice as to what they want to pursue. I do. I am suspicious of parents who you know, want to have a child uh, exactly like the way they want it and fit them into a mold and give them music lessons and, and that kind of thing, because uh, they have to be a musician. But I think enhancing all their capabilities, it's kind of hard to argue with that to me. So that's one area I think we're already seeing that is basically with children, um, and it will become more and more, uh, more, more specific the changes we can make as we learn more about the technology. But in terms of ourselves, again, we're at a very crude level. Level right now, where we you know, take drugs to affect our bodies and brains, uh, 
Um, I mean, you can make some pretty amazing transformations with steroids, right? If you take those, we have some incredibly huge people that couldn't exist in the past, but those have some downsides. Uh, we have very crude mood drugs right now. Um, uh, again, I, I think as we learn more about the underlying biology, and we can affect that at a more basic level. Instead of intervening in the biological process kind of in the middle, we'll be upset various things and cause some disturbances elsewhere. Um, you know, like dependent persons can have uh, uh, cause you know, sleepiness or sexual dysfunction sometimes. If you can actually fix that at the root, then you can have a much better system. And I, I think uh, in terms of kind of fundamental changes to human nature, uh, you know, I, I talked about how we have this kind of us and them mentality. We're also very bad at uh, our understanding our emotions. And there's biological reasons for that. If you actually look at the structure of the brain, there's a really good book called The Emotional Brain by Joseph Ledoux, which I recommend. Um, he points out that if you look at the brain, what you see is all these connections going from basically you know, the senses to the emotional centers of the brain and then to the cognitive centers. So basically it's designed or evolved so that C, uh, and the same which is tiger, feel fear, run, right? That's, that's a good mechanism because it saves your life and so it gets built into a revolution. The trouble is today that doesn't work very well because we don't face saber tooth tigers, we face very complex problems involving lots of people. And uh, feeling fear drives people into very bad so-called solutions. And I think we're seeing, well, I give lots of examples of that today, it might be controversial, but I think there's a lot of fear-based decision-making. Um, and until we, that's very hard to overcome, I think we can make progress culturally, but that's one of those things that's gonna be hard to overcome as long as we have a brain that is preferentially designed to act on fear. Uh, and I think we need to better, uh, build new pathways, which in principle we could do with uh, nerve growth factor, genetic engineering, various methods, even implanting synthetic neurons like Ted Burke is working at, uh, on, at the USC. We could actually add new pathways in the brain that might allow you to understand your emotions better. Like right now, you might, you know, many people often feel anxious or uncomfortable about something and they think, why am I feeling like this? They can't figure it out because you don't have good access to that part of the brain. But imagine you could really understand your feelings and motivations. You might realize, oh, I'm being a bit of a shit here. I'm being unpleasant to that person because I feel insecure about that. Imagine you have much better insight. Uh, it might be harder to you know, do stupid, unpleasant things if you really understand your behavior. So there's a lot of different areas like that where I think we're just at the very beginnings uh, of the technologies that will allow us to choose ourselves better. Interesting. So we have a uh, question that uh, stems off of this uh, from a staff member, actually, um, that uh, comes to the question of uh, designing um, uh, children for uh, purposes of uh, IVF. Um, so the question is, uh, does the potential for causing an increase in uh, class stratification, uh, inequalities and inequities in society, uh, give you pause on um, the idea of uh, designing kids or uh, giving kids uh, additional um, capabilities beyond what would be uh, normal. Well, I mean, this concern comes up with every new technology, it seems. You can't have this technology because it, not everybody can afford it right away, and therefore it's going to increase inequalities. But if you think about the uh, implications of that approach, then we really couldn't have any technologies at all, uh, or any of the ones that are extremely cheap and immediately available, which is almost none of them in practice historically. So I don't think that's a good objection to stopping this. What that means really is uh, we should actually encourage innovation. We should remove barriers to these technologies uh, so they become cheaper quicker. And you know, I mentioned the FDA. It's my favorite agency to hate. I just I can't stand the FDA. I think it's an appalling agency that should be abolished, at least cut back. Because what it does is it massively increases the cost of all kinds of health technologies, and it continually expands its empire. Um, it's always it's trying to control everything. Sometimes it battles with the CDC, who has the who has the authority. But it's always expanding its power. And if you the more you regulate these kind of technologies, um, the more you slow down than going down in price. And if you think about one of the you know pretty low regulation areas of the economy is computers and mobile phones. And, you know, back in the, the you know, 1990 or so, people would say, well, you can't, you know, the problem with these technologies is all the, the rich executives will have these mobile phones and nobody else will. And they weren't even thinking about the kind of phones we have today, which are vastly better than what they were thinking of then. But now we see, you know, poor people have these. People in Africa even share them in villages and are, over, and are actually jumping a whole uh, generation of technology infrastructure. So I think the answer is not to, to be concerned about that, but not to stop it, not to restrict it, in fact, to speed it up, because that's the way that it gets spread to more and more people. And it's almost inevitable for technologies that are expensive that they begin for the few, and those people with more wealthy actually fund the extension of the technology so it becomes easy to produce in large numbers. And we've seen that in everything from automobiles to phones to you know, whatever you can think of. The things that tend to stick with very expensive things are other things that are inherently expensive, like very large you know, power generating systems, or, um, or things that are regulated by government very heavily, so you just can't get much competition there. So I think leave it open to innovation, and I think prices will come down fairly quickly. 
That's very encouraging. Uh, so we have um, maybe about uh, three more questions uh, to cover. Um, I'm just being a little bit conscious of time. We have uh, five more minutes in the session. Um, do you have to go right at five? Uh, I've got a little bit longer, but not too much. My wife's got another interview she's doing next door, so I need to cut off fairly soon then. All right, sounds bit. good. Uh, then we'll try to uh, plow through just uh, a couple more. Um, so I think uh, the... Oh, before we do, can I just um, talk to my wife? If you want a kind of introduction to transhumanism, this is going to come out backwards, okay. Uh, on Amazon's little booklet, uh, Transhumanism, What Is It? by Natasha Vidamola. It's a good, very short introduction. If you've got a bigger appetite, our, our big volume, The Transhumanist Reader, has dozens of essays by top thinkers, and my first essay kind of gives you a real overview of transhumanism, so I have to get my little commercial book in there. <laughs> For sure, I, I have that second one. It's a great read. All right, so um, I want to uh, stem off of the uh, the frustration that we have uh, with the um, uh, FDA and uh, all of the assorted uh, health regulators and uh, other countries that are the uh, equivalent of the FDA. Um, they seem to operate uh, based on um, what's called the precautionary principle, um, which underlies their uh, whole philosophy. And um, you've previously proposed an alternative approach, um, which is the proactionary principle. So I wanted um, uh, you to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what that means uh, to you and uh, whether you see there being uh, some uh, hope coming in the future um, of there being a major paradigm shift uh, away from uh, the current approach uh, towards this kind of uh, new principle. Wait, two minutes to cover this, it's done. Okay, uh, <laughs> so yeah. The, Sorry, the, the, it's a heavy one. <laughs> the precautionary principle is actually uh, embodied in the European um, Constitution, unfortunately, so people have to use this, and I think it's a terrible principle for decision making. It basically comes from the idea of, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't, well, the simplest form is, is uh, look before you leap, but that's not really the way it works. It basically, if you boil it down to the reality of it, it basically says don't try anything for the first time. Um, there's, there's different versions of it, but essentially it says that uh, any new technology or production methods proposed, you have to prove that it's not going to harm human beings in any important way. Now, that, that's deeply problematic because, first of all, it's totally one-sided. It's just looking at the problems it might cause. It's not, it's not evaluating that on a cost-benefit analysis. It's not looking at the positive sides. Um, and it's fundamentally flawed also because that's not the way we learn. We don't learn by sitting in our armchairs and figuring out how things will work out in the future. It's a very kind of Platonist idea of knowledge. Um, I'm more with kind of the Aristotelian empirical view. You need to do stuff and figure out what's going on. So you, you, don't, you can't just look before you leap. You've got to look while leaping and keep looking as, you, as you're leaping along. Because you just can't, I mean, imagine, you know, even in 1980, trying to figure out the future of mobile phones. I remember when I was a, in a teenager in Bristol going to an exhibit at the Museum of Video Phones, and I was like, wow, video phones, you can see each other. But we had no concept of all the apps and, you know, the GPS systems and all this other stuff you could do. Um, so you can't really, you can't really foresee how a technology will work out. The only way you can do that is to let people do it and keep proper laws of liability and so on, and obviously proper testing. Uh, people have informed consent. But you can't just shut things down because there might be problems. Um, so that, that's kind of one motivation why I oppose the precautionary principle and developed the proactionary principle. We had a um, sort of online uh, a symposium a number of years ago where we had people like Marvin Minsky and Ray Kurzweil, and we, we talked about this stuff, um, and I ended up basically those thoughts together with mine and coming up with this new principle, proactionary principle, which starts from the idea that the freedom to innovate is extremely valuable to human beings. We wouldn't be where we are without the freedom to innovate, so that's the most important thing to protect. But then, and again, I can't go into detail on this, but if people want to check out my uh, on my on my blog, if you go to Strategic Philosophy, um, you'll find blogs on this. I've got several posts from a few years ago. Uh, there are a lot of sub principles which require us to rely not on you know public opinion or people's feelings, but on the best known methods for evaluating knowledge. And I go into some detail about that. Um, and one that's particularly relevant to what we've been discussing to treat human and natural risks equivalent. A lot of people you know say, oh, this is natural, so that's okay. Uh, whereas if humans do it, it's somehow bad, right? I say that's just nonsense. You know, it's the bad outcomes that matter. It doesn't matter where they come from. So they have to be treated equally. So it's basically like 10 sub principles which I can't really go into, but it's basically pro-choice, um, pro-freedom, but you know, with, with very good decision-making processes to uh, reduce the side effects and to learn as we go along. I think that's the only realistic way we can deal with new technologies and new options. 
makes a lot of sense. I hope that I, that paradigm shift uh, comes in the not too distant future. So I want to. Well, yeah, actually, uh, actually, I didn't really address that, but I think there is some hope. Um, you know, starting back in the, I guess, the 1980s to 90s, the first kind of chinks in the armor of FDA regulation on this came from the AIDS activists who said, well, look, you're, you're, you're restricting progress with these new drugs that could treat AIDS, and people are dying. You, know, you can say, well, it might be dangerous. Well, I'm going to be fucking dead, you idiot. <laughs> Let me try them. And there's a lot of stuff like that where they say, oh, it could have side effects. Yeah, well, otherwise I'm going to be dead. So it's kind of stupid. Um, people need informed consent, but they need to make these decisions for themselves because these agencies are politicized. Uh, so that, that was kind of the first chink in the armor. And now with COVID, I think we've seen the same thing, uh, especially when people realize that we actually developed the first vaccine in one weekend, right at the beginning of the epidemic. But it took a long time to go through all the processes of FDA approval, the hidden our human challenge trials. We could probably never have had a second wave in the country, let alone third and fourth waves. Um, but it was just incredibly slow because of that. Uh, so there are, I think those things may be starting to make some more people realize, well, there are some problems with this paradigm. That makes a lot of sense. So um, I'm going to uh, segue that actually uh, into a question from a donor, which is uh, pretty much uh, the last question um, for us, except uh, just one final one uh, to end things. Uh, so this question is uh, just generally, um, how do you think the world is going to look um, 10 years from now in the, in the near future? Oh boy, it's been 10 years. I'm not sure. I mean, there's so many different aspects of that, but I'm not sure I can really answer that. And right now, I'm actually quite uncertain as to whether the next 10 years will be uh, a lot worse or a lot better. It's. Uh, I think we're kind of on the edge of either getting a lot, be a lot, a lot better or a lot worse. <laughs> I'm not sure which way we're going to go right now. So um, I'm a little pessimistic in that there's, there's so much bad regulation of these technologies. There's a lot of political division and just bad thinking that I'm a little pessimistic. On the other hand, it's hard to predict. Sometimes things can flip very quickly. And looking at the influence of other countries, it depends on the direction they're going. Like China is looking a little bit bad right now. It looks like they're actually reimposing old-fashioned communism more. Um, so that's not really a great sign. <laughs> I kind of, I don't really know. I'm not going to make a forecast for the next 10 years. It's, I think in terms of the, the technologies we're talking about, I think despite the regulations, they will continue to advance. Um, I think there's a lot of momentum there and a lot of interest in those. So uh, even if it's not here, other countries will continue to do that. So I think we'll still gradual progress, not as fast as I'd like to see. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. So there's uh, one more question, um, just to end things off. Uh, this one's a little bit of a, uh, a fun question. Uh, so in light of um, the idea of uh, beyond human freedom of form and uh, morphological freedom in general, uh, and as the biotech needed for it um, becomes available, um, what do you personally want to be? And uh, what is uh, post-human Max Moore in the future? Well, I don't know. I, I guess in terms of the army motto, I want to be all that I can be. Uh, but what is that? I'm not quite sure. Uh, it's hard to answer that question because, you know, what I want will change over time, no doubt. So uh, I can only answer sort of generally. I, I think it depends on what kind of time, time frame we're talking about. But let's, let's say, yeah, we're talking about quite a few decades from now when we beat an aging problem, we have a lot more control of biology. Um, I think that. Uh, well, the intermediate term, which is the next couple of centuries maybe, uh, I would like to be able to um, not be limited to this one human body, even if it doesn't age and it's you know, very resistant to any kind of danger or damage. You know, I'm now going to lace diamond fibers in my skull so I can survive a, falling off a mountain or whatever. I would like to have the ability to transfer um, my mind, not my brain, but my mind, and you know, that would be a, an argument about that as to how that's possible, um, into different bodies. It could just be telepresence or it could be actual uh, transfer. I'd like to have different bodies different purposes. I like to have an underwater body, I like to have maybe uh, a body that doesn't look like any species that exists right now that uh, could have all kinds of different capabilities. Um, I've always liked space travel and I realize that these, these eight bodies are really not good for space, they don't do well in space at all, so I might need a radically different body for that. So I guess the answer really is that rather than being any particular one way, I'd like to have a lot of options in terms of my physical form. And I'd like to have the option to shape my, my mentality, my, my cognitive structure, my emotional structure, uh, the way I see it. Yeah, I, I think I would, again, it's very hard to predict longer than that because if I'm a lot smarter than I am right now, I know a lot more, I have a lot more experience, I'm going to have a very different view of what I want to become probably. So I can't really give a long-term view, but basically it's about more options, uh, more experimentation. And hopefully being around other, uh, you know, on a social level, I look forward to living in a society very different from what we're in right now, a society of people who like to experiment and push the frontier. And whether that's on this planet or, or in a space colony somewhere, I don't know, but I would love to be part of forming a new society where we're a lot more open to exploration and discovery and initiative than we are in today's culture. 
Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, Pleasure. And thank you to everyone uh, who um, uh, posed some questions. Uh, so this uh, session uh, has been recorded and we'll uh, post it afterwards uh, for anyone who couldn't make it. Um, so thank you again, and I, I think uh, that's it. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right. Be well, live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper.